So this afternoon's panel, thank you for all being here. It's a beautiful day outside, so we do appreciate everybody sitting in this dark room. Um, but just to say a couple of words uh, of introduction, um, the, the topic of today's conversation, the political economy of art, um, really kind of stemmed from a conversation around questions about what we see in the art fair and how we might kind of think about some of those histories of, of political practice that we now see in the art fair um, and how that might relate to, to what's happening today kind of on the ground outside, as it were. Um, so we really wanted to think about not just artists who are kind of talking about um, political situations, but really using their practice to um, enact and and to change and to, to think through social and political conditions in a real kind of direct and real sense. Um, so hopefully the conversation is really kind of around the many different roles that artists take on in that, that gallerists take on, that collectors take on, um, how they think about their practice in relation to ideas about the political and social context that they work in, um, how they fund that, how that then gets translated into modes that kind of circulate in gallery and then art fair contexts. Um, so obviously, in particular, with the kind of context of the art fair, um, such kind of practices that are very social, participatory, politically engaged, quite often feel quite distinct from the kind of discrete objects that maybe we see in the um, fair. Um, but nevertheless, the artists that we've got on the panel here today are absolutely kind of working with private galleries, working with private collectors um, to think about how to support their work, not just in terms of patronage, but also in terms of kind of the economies of the art market. Um, so to just very briefly introduce myself, um, my name's Rose Lejeune and I'm a independent curator based in London. Um, so I'm really kind of working somewhere between a kind of research and curatorial mode that thinks about um, collecting in the kind of broadest spectrum of contemporary art practice, working with both with museums and some private collectors um, to think about archiving, documenting and kind of extending collections to include kind of social and performative and process-based practices. Um, so in terms of that, at the moment, obviously, in the UK, um, we're seeing some sorts of kind of political uncertainty, we might say. Um, and in the art world, we're very much seeing kind of shifting lines between the public and the private realms. Um, and so this set of questions about kind of the shifting roles of artists and of collectors, both in the art market and in public structures, or the kind of museum structures and not-for-profit structures in the UK, are certainly really kind of complex and really kind of shifting at the moment. Um, so I think there's some really great questions to be talked about, about artistic practice, about agency, about the role of art and culture, kind of in the broadest sense. Um, so we've got five really fantastic speakers here this afternoon who are hopefully going to do a lot of this kind of work for us. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing uh, Casey Wong, who's at the far end of the panel. Um, so Dr. Casey Wong is an artist and activist. Um, he's a Hong Kong native, um, and his research kind of investigates the artist and designer's role in social um, social political causes and the space between people and their living environment. So just to give you one example of a work, um, the, his work Paddling Home is a four by four by four meter uh, house. So a tiny little building that resembles a kind of typical Hong Kong apartment block um, that has been somehow completed to also operate as a paddling boat with two oars that be, can be pushed out from the walls, um, allowing the house to be so slowly paddled away. Um, so again, this is obviously kind of questioning sort of alternative ways to live in the city, thinking about freedom, thinking about how to go to a better place, perhaps. Um, Casey is also a founding member of the Umbrella Art Movement, Umbrella Movement Art Preservation, um, and a former curator and member of the Parasite um, Art Space. He's also a former assistant professor at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, and I wanted, really, just in that sense, to ask you first to kind of introduce your practice. Um, a little bit for us, uh, maybe thinking about the work that I've just mentioned, but also another work that you mentioned to me when we were talking just before the panel, um, which is a work uh, that I haven't actually written down the name of, um, uh, around, uh, which is a, a unofficial um, uh, 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 homage to, to the Chinese Nobel Peace, Peace Prize laureate, oh, yes, yes. Li Bo. Um, I wonder if you might just introduce yourself and in particular tell us a bit about that work. Hi, uh, I'm Casey Wong. Uh, Rose was mentioning that work is uh, called I Have No Enemies, which is a public, which is an illegal public sculpture um, secretly installed 
to commemorate the Nobel Prize laureate Liu Xiaobo is uh, is on the coast coastline of Hong Kong somewhere. I cannot tell you. And uh, it's um it's like a metal chair, uh, kind of a model after uh, the empty chair during the Nobel Prize award ceremony, and uh, and it's uh, on the back of it. It inscribed in Chinese, "I have no enemies," which is a, uh, which is uh, his famous book. Yeah, I think uh, developing off-site, off-the-grid artistic platform are important for Hong Kong as well as everywhere else. Meaning, uh, uh, art activities can practice normally meaning there's no boundary, every pro topic can be explored as well as uh, cannot be censored nor destroyed. So, I mean, I, in the past five years, I've been exploring that. I mean, I'm still uh, participating in conventional events such as this one, as well as uh, pushing the envelope and try to uh, think about what that kind of platform might be. Yes, thank you. So just to move on to kind of introduce everybody, I wanted to move to Tayaba, who, um, Tayaba Begum Lippi, who, who makes paintings, prints, videos, installations. I think just don't touch it. I think it just should work. Um, and in particular, you work kind of recreating everyday objects, including kind of beds, bathtubs, wheelchairs, dressing tables, um, and women's undergarments, and all sorts of everyday things, but using unexpected materials, um, such as safety pens and razor blades. Um, and I guess in particular, kind of speaking about the violence towards women in Bangladesh, where you're from, um, as well as referencing kind of tools for childbirth um, and in some of the more kind of underdeveloped parts of the country. And I guess when I was looking at your practice, you were talking a lot about this relationship between the personal, your experiences as a woman in Bangladesh, but also how that works kind of relating to broader social, community, political contexts. Um, so you've had exhibitions in, in London, in Dakar, at the Guggenheim in New York, um, at the Broad in LA, um, here at the Asia Society, uh, in last year's Taiwan Art Biennale. Um, but also you kind of, in 2002, you founded the Brito Arts Trust, um, which is a kind of comprised of a network of artist studios in, in Dakar as Bangladesh's first kind of artist-run alternative art platform. Um, so I wonder if you might just start by kind of introducing your practice a bit more to us in a bit more detail. So, um, um, if I go through my like whole journey as uh, not only my own work, as you said so, uh, it's all about like the journey with the community, journey with my contemporaries and uh, the journey uh, that we needed to make uh, needed to make in uh, like uh, back uh, in, like 17 18 years ago uh, when there was no platform at all in Bangladesh to do alternative art practice or express whatever you want to express uh, because it was a mainstream art scenario in Bangladesh during the time and uh, we had only uh, few number of galleries who were um, interested about the like um, well-known senior artist, not about the artists who were experimenting. So that was the time when we thought that we needed actually to make our own platform. That's how Brito came. Uh, so I am one of the founder trustees of Brito Arts Trust, which is not only working, uh, I mean, I'm, we are not only working for ourselves, but for the um, artist community, especially the younger generation artists and emerging artists. So um, one thing we realized that, you know, whatever we do, uh, we have to uh, be active and work hard to establish ourselves in the country, first of all. Uh, locally and then like internationally. So that's how actually the journey uh, started uh, with this uh, kind of commitment. And uh, we do a lot of uh, projects with communities and all. But at the same time, uh, uh, if I look at my own work, so it was like uh, developing myself 
so day by day, you know, from uh, like from uh, nowhere to somewhere. So, <laughs> so it's a uh, long journey, and then um, since we work with the uh, artist community in Bangladesh, it's also a lot of sharing and exchanges over there. So it will reflect in your work anyway. And my personal works are uh, related to uh, the, of course, the society. And since I am a, a female artist, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'm not, uh, I'm proud to be a female artist. Anyway, <laughs> then um, uh, the situation in Bangladesh is a bit different than any other country because we, um, there is a, you know, the, there is a rising of um, religious fundamentalist um, in last, uh, over the last few years. So um, there are a lot of work related to that background and um, coming from the uh, arts and uh, like uh, the thing what is happening in the country that you don't support, but you can't speak about it because um, there is a lot of uh, pressure um, from the government, from uh, different parts of the society, of course the religious fundamentalist. So at the same time, so you have to be very careful about what you are doing. And uh, then, you know, how you are also going through all this thing, and you have to be very careful about what you are saying, more than what you are doing. So uh, some of my works are very much related to uh, that uh, context. Um, recently, I have done um, the exhibition at Shrine Empire Gallery in New Delhi, which, is, uh, uh, which was titled as Vanity Fair, where I was criticizing myself. Uh, because we are not actually, we're part of the whole process. So we are not outsiders. So this vanity fair was showing uh, how I look at my work as product. At the same time, so I wanted to talk about my own society. So it was coming like there was a uh, piece which was uh, related to some uh, kind of uh, violence and um, uh, also the political situation, social uh, situation in Bangladesh, which was like, I produced some t-shirts because while you can't talk about uh, the crisis in the society, then how can we actually deliver what we think about? So that, you know, the, it's better to wear something and show that what you want to say. So there were like slogans like freedom of speech, abuse of of power or bail denied because because you know that Shaidul Alam was arrested uh, for nothing like more than 100 days in the uh, jail and that time five times I think his bail was denied uh, so that's why it came then the hell is empty that was another slogan and um, because I think that the everybody wants to go to heaven uh, <laughs> Especially in Bangladesh, they are so religious, I mean, most of the people. So that, you know, the hell is empty for me. So I had a cat work with all this, um, like, uh, T-shirts. Uh, and uh, I, I, it was not a ramp, but it was made like a ramp. And I titled it, uh, What If I Am Modeling? Because of course, I am not fit to model, <laughs> be a model. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true necessarily, but um, so so to move on, um, I wanted to ask Corrado next. Actually, um, I, I, I was looking again on your website for your gallery this morning, and, and the front page of it says, "If I, I if you don't deal with politics, is saying you don't deal with politics is like saying I don't deal with life," um, and that seemed to me to really kind of sum up something about the gallery that you run in Sicily, um, which has been in Modica for 10 years now. Um, 12. 
And I think since the beginning, it's really been kind of interested in this kind of idea of research and the, like the human condition and activism. And um, again, this kind of uh, just a, a very short kind of look at your exhibitions over the last two or three years. And they're called things like propaganda, welcome to my age of anxiety, artists against m moods, um, freedom is a constant struggle. Um, and I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about not only the gallery and the programme, but also the context of, yes. of, of Modica. Yes. Uh, now, first of all, thank you very much for your introduction. As, uh, and also, thank you very much for this invitation. As I've told you, I'm very happy to be here and happy to share this stage with the other panelists. It's really something for me. As I told you, as you told us, uh, um, I have the gallery in Modica, which is a, a Sicilian town in southeast of Sicily. Now are 12 years. And uh, I opened the gallery, but now, fortunately, I'm not alone because I have a business partner, a gallery partner, which is Beva here with me. And um, for, some, for some aspects, we are a normal gallery since we do art fairs, we have represented artists, Italian and international. Then, um, yes, we have maybe, a fo I can say we have a focus on um, art and activism. But you tell something that I feel very important. If I have to frame our activities, and if I have to put together all our artists, I, can, I could say that we, we do, we develop a research about the human condition. Of course, um, um, we really do, it's, it's nice that you told us all the names of the show, no? Because it seems to be, we usually love to take a position. Um, this is uh, something that we try to do in the place where we live, which is very important, which come out often in each discussion about my works, about, about our works, but also, we take position also in uh, something where you sometimes you need more revision, so something more international uh, struggle, for example. So what does mm, and we we do all these things through the work of our artists, and this is uh, it's very important. So uh, the place where we come from is a special place for a lot of reasons, and. Um, also, the, I mean, under the architectural point of view, it's a baroque town, so we try to use this space as a, a theater, but not only with performance. Also involving people, involving our local community in participatory projects, which is sometimes more simple, because in the south of the world, this is still possible in a more easy way. This is my opinion. And yes. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to Pedro next. Um, so Pedro Barbosa is a, is a collector and patron from Sao Paulo, um, a former trader. Um, he and his wife, um, Patricia, have acquired over 500 conceptual artworks. Um, not only artworks, actually, but really importantly, kind of ephemera, artists, postcards, books, albums, music seems like it's a big part of the collection as well, um, both from the 1960s and 70s right up to, to today. Um, but also, over time, your collecting activity has kind of become more and more maybe institutional is, 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 is a word to use. Um, so since 2012 in particular, you've really been supporting residencies for artists and curators, both to go to Brazil, but also, for example, to come to London and stay at the Delfina Foundation. Um, but also you've more recently started a publication program for, for artists to make their first publication book um, and a new art and science residency um, program with the, with the University of Sao Paulo. Um, so one of the things I kind of think is really interesting about what you're doing, and I think it's written on one of the slides that's kind of flashing around on the, at the top here is about being focused on, on, on listening to what artists and artworks have to teach us. Um, and I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about that approach and in what you're doing. Well, well um, actually, I use what artists have to say uh, to express myself, okay? So it's an appropriation. Uh, so, of course, there are many artists in the collection. So, when I put them together, you can read what I'm trying to express myself. Because I'm not able to 
write or to make, a, you know, let's say a speech about, you know, my ideology and my thoughts. So by reading uh, their work, uh, one is able to see what is uh, in my mind. Simple as that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So finally, Basil. So Basil Abbas, who together with, with Ruan Abu Rame, who's not here today, um, works across a range of sound, image, text, installation and performance. Um, so you've, you, it's a practice that's kind of, I, I'm going to read this because it's, I couldn't kind of rewrite it in a way that, that, that I, in any way really at all. So it says, is engaged in the intersections between performativity, political imaginaries, the body and virtuality through a kind of sampling of materials, both existing and self-authored, um, sound, image, text, objects uh, get recast into new scripts of multimedia installations and live sound. Um, so, so as a duo, you've had many, many exhibitions, of course, including solo shows at the ICA in Philadelphia, at the Kunstverein in Hamburg in Germany. You've been in the Biennials Istanbul, Sharjah, Hangzhou, Sao Paulo. Um, and I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about kind of your approach to making, to making work in those kind of different places. So, um, in those different, like how, how? Or ju just maybe just introduce just your practice. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that, that, that's probably an easier one. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, as, as Rose said, I work with uh, another artist, Ruan Aburahme, and we're like a duo. We've been working together for 10 years. And I think, I mean, through the 10 years, um, things have quite like shifted a little bit about you know what our um, or how we work, but I think what's important is why we started working and why we wanted to do what we wanted, what we did. So we both didn't really study art. I uh, was I come more from a sound and music background, and Ruan came more from uh, a film background. Um, and we were both very frustrated with our mediums, I would say, and frustrated with uh, the limitation of a medium. Uh, but also, more importantly, uh, we, we were both Palestinians, we both come from Palestine, and we were majorly frustrated at the production of images from Palestine. And the sort of repetition of these images had, um, in the media had kind of made sort of um, things start to lose their potency, or these images start to lose their potency. So really for us, what really brought us together was this search for a new political language and, 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 and a new uh, imaginary and a new way to sort of, um, uh, yeah, to, to, to imagine the world in a different way, but, and to read Palestine, I would say, in a different way as well. So what we try to do is, um, s you know, the Palestinian issue is like, a, uh, has been become like a ghettoized thing that is spoken of as, as a, a um, as uh, some sort of um, special case. Um, and what we try to do is actually read the world from Palestine. So we, we, we take our experiences and we, and we relate them to the wider issues in the world, let's say. Um, so I think that's um, what drives the work. But I would say that another thing is that we, we have um, a very large research-based practice. So we make sort of large projects that have multiple iterations. And some of these iterations are not, some of these iterations are outside the art context, very importantly for us. And some of these iterations are anonymous as well. So we don't put our names on them. So. Um, and this is a question maybe both to you and to Casey as well, to a certain extent then. So the next question is, is, is like, what's the di what, what for you is kind of useful about being in a gallery at some times? Like, what does that space provide um, that, that maybe you can't have outside and vice versa? Like a commercial gallery, you mean? Well, or any kind of a public presentation? Um, I think it depends each time on the context, I would say. And, you know... We're, we're also, we also like what we do formally, right? So we're interested 
very actually that's what we initially you know I I was 13 or 14 when I had my initial sort of um, interest in artistic practice and form so I think there is that drive but then there is the, the, the need to say something out of that and not just present it as that as a form um, so it really depends on the context and I think that you know um, opening up the space to uh, sort of imagine a different world is 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 something that is able to happen in a in a gallery. It's able to happen through sort of uh, sound and image and uh, text and 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 so so it's not about you know our our, our works have a very open ended sort of uh, interpretive sort of. Um, uh, aspect to them, so it doesn't close things up, but they op it opens things up. So, like I said, it was it's a research-based practice that allows things to come in and uh, maybe maybe opens up more questions than it gives tries to give answers. And so, when people experience our work, they experience them in very different ways. And sometimes they read things that we didn't intend, but that's on but that's on purpose. That's why we you know that's why we put them in that way. I would say. Um, but then there are different contexts, such as um, in Palestine, for example, uh, more specifically in Ramallah, where, where, where we live, half the year at least, um, where we don't actually exhibit. So um, not because there isn't any spaces to exhibit, but because um, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really create that space because of, um, I would say, a sort of more uh, elitist and closed um, closed sort of small group of people that go to the same shows, you see what I mean? And so it's important to then think about how do you find new spaces and new ways to engage with people outside of that. But then if you, you know, in, in countries where people people, let's say, where you have large institutions and, uh, you know, families go on the weekend to the museums, then you have that opportunity to speak to people or you have that opportunity to open up that discussion, I would say. Mm. So it's, it really depends on the context. Um, but there's something really interesting in what you're describing about, um, uh, about showing the work in the context that it's made versus showing the work kind of outside of that context. Which I, so I wanna bring Casey in here a little bit as well because I guess we've also been speaking before about Hong Kong and and why you may or may not choose to do certain things in Hong Kong right now, which which maybe has a kind of a parallel. I think it's uh, the White Wall Gallery or museum space are still useful because to uh, we're an artist, we're with this background and might as well use it and, and it's, it's a tradition and and I mean, the, 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 the white wall represents a certain abstraction mm. of looking or abstraction of uh, understanding some something. It can be politics, it can be uh, beauty. And uh, it, ha it, it will um, continue to uh, perform its function. But as the society is uh, starting to closing up uh, in terms of ideas, then these kind of abstract space are no longer safe. So, but, but there's a certain seriousness about this kind of museum space and gallery space. So it's important to uh, practice there as well as out there so that, um, so that the subject matter that the artist exploring can be uh, studied seriously and pass on and get the endorsement maybe from the brand, whatever, institutions. But I don't think, uh, but as, as I mentioned, when society is starting to get close, the evil of banality steps in, right? And then these, uh, especially like in Hong Kong as well as China, uh, the curator will be controlled because it's public fundings. And, and it will be squeezed and then get, getting tighter and tighter. As a matter of fact, uh, what's going on in Hong Kong right now uh, in terms of censorship and uh, and uh, it actually reflects the uh, Xi Jinping's 2013 cultural policy. He was saying that no space would be uh, accepted, not even the dance floor. 
That, that means like if you, you, have, you can't do certain dance, you have to do this type of dance. So you, you can imagine um, the, uh, the possibility of, of uh, having this, this freedom of thinking is, uh, uh, should never be only relying on the traditional white wall gallery and museums because you know, they're not uh, gonna perform. Maybe social media, maybe off-site, off off-grid uh, kind of uh, venues. Um, yeah, graffiti artist strategy, maybe. So, so in that sense, kind of, there's a there's a there's a there's a sense in which that visibility of the gallery actually becomes somewhere that, that is therefore more difficult to say anything. It is. It's getting more and more. Even the fairs in here is mm. getting more and more difficult to. I mean, not not only economically, you know, the rent in here is very high, <laughs> but but as well as uh, you know, who's buying, right? Who's buying? Who? People who come in here or our central over there, they are, you know they represent kind of the upper echelon of the society, and they are mostly conservative people. Mm. And you know if they own a piece of uh, Palestinian work and uh, an Israeli friend might not like it, so it creates a lot of problem, right? So you, you can see economy, money, ideas, and then you all and who's backing it up, yeah. right? All somehow intermingled. You're skipping right ahead to, to a whole other kind of kettle of fish, which I think we will do, get on to. But I want to first ask a little bit about, about, about your audiences in Sicily then. Yes. Just to, to stick with this idea of the kind of um, that, that space of the gallery and the space of a kind of local audience and, 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 and the kind of activism that you might enact. And this is both to you, Corrado, and then also to, to Taiba in terms of Dakar. Mm. Of course, there is an art community in Sicily, and they follow us. Maybe we, I can say after 12 years, I don't have a big group of collectors in Sicily. Maybe I have to do more work. I have to work hardly, more hard on in this aspect. But I can say we are open to the community. It's just not a theoretical thing. Uh, our space, it's at disposal of our community, of association, or um, group of activists. And then, uh, you know, talking about the local community, what I feel interesting to say is that, um, as we had maybe in a conversation before, uh, our space is a safe space. So you can really say strong things. You can really uh, say things that in other contexts are problematic. No? I represent an artist that has developed a project called the New World Summit, uh, where he uh, create alternative parliament for political groups that have been blacklisted. So they are labeled as terrorists. And we do shows about this. Of course, I can talk about this more if you want. But it's more about uh, this idea that when you do something in a space that is safe, uh, if it's only this, if you do only for this, it's problematic. No? If you do art uh, for the art world, it's problematic. If you do art for the world, and then this project has helped this, has been supportive of a lot of other people around is good. But just talking about the local community, I want to say this thing, that sometime, uh, when you talk about things uh, that are far from the place where you live, uh, it's not so problematic. Che people can clap the hand, e more easy at least, okay? Instead, when you start to talk uh, about uh, your local community, local stories, which are local because, okay, we label as a local because they happen in our territory, but then maybe are very similar to other fights or other struggles that are in other places of the world, it's become more complicated and more uncomfortable. And I, f I started slowly, slowly to feel this more interesting. So I started with the idea, we started with the idea to use our visibility to give support to these people. And some years ago, just for example, to tell an experience of something of unconventional that can happen in, art, in an art space, maybe, uh, we decide to support uh, this struggle that is in this movement called artist, uh, called the No Moose Movement. 
in our region, like 30 kilometers from Modica, there is this American base called MUOS. MUOS is a system of um, satellites that control uh, the drones. So I use it for the new wars, for the new wars of the new millennium, for the invisible wars. And of course, uh, apart that this American base has been built inside a natural reserve, apart uh, that of course are used for, uh, for, a w for, for wars, uh, for invisible wars, which it's more unethical, then they are accused because of their electromagnetic waves, because there are, I think, around 200,000 people that live around this. Okay, at one point, after the fact that you have done show about uh, stories that are in the northern part of, about Rojava, about story about the northern part of Syria, stories about uh, colonial histories, stories, you know, all around. But I think it's the right moment to do something about this, no? And we start to make a research, and we discovered there was a, a lot of activists locally that start to use art start to make cartoonists, start to make films, start to make um, joke, to make photo. And we decided to invite them, and we did this show. And the, for us, it has been really one of the more strong experience. We decided, together with my colleague, to write directly the text of the show. So since that point, every time that we do this type of project, we usually take this responsibility. We write the text. After that, uh, we did this show, we make a research, and it's a struggle that is still going on, because there is this strong, there is the most, and there is the no most movement, we are supporting the no most movement. And uh, it's still a struggle that is going on. I'm sorry to say that the, the satellites are working now, but they've been delayed, the, the starting of the, uh, I've been delayed for two years, so it's already a result. And then there is a struggle in the streets sometimes, in the court of the tribunal, is still going on. I'm sure that at one point they will put their hand off of our region. But anyway, talking about this and talking about something of English, then we try to uh, to make a co we did the conference. We invite uh, people that was, we think could say something about this. We invite Charles for a conference uh, about this. And during this conference, we had our whole with um, undercover police. No, so which is something uh, unusual in an art world where you can say everything. So, so sometimes I think we have to take the responsibility to change. Uh, um, our relation with this local community can be very, something very powerful, can give us a lot of opportunity. This is what I think. And, and Lippi, perhaps you could say something. I, I, again, I read a kind of quote just recently that you were about talking about not just the community in terms of an audience, but in terms of building and developing an artist's community. Um, and this idea of the kind of energy that kind of be, could be created through these synergies. Um, and it, it strikes me that this idea of uh, you know, Casey's saying on the one hand that actually the arts, art galleries are not necessarily places where you can do or say anything. They're in fact being very kind of controlled. Um, but that nevertheless, there is this sense of being able to kind of talk amongst a community. And it strikes me that that's quite quite close to what you were talking about um, in terms of in terms of developing not just the space, but your own work and the relationships that you are having with, uh, say, for example, craftspeople. Um, I, I, um, I mean, um, I think we need everything actually side by side because once you don't have one thing, you feel like, you know, this is empty, this part is empty. So, um, since there is no galleries, um, representing any artist over there, that's also a big problem in Bangladesh because then the artist cannot sell anything. And, uh, or, you know, very little selling is there. And we have a very small uh, number of collectors. But at the same time, the artists are struggling and doing all these community projects. Um, and now, for the last, uh, like over the last uh, seven, eight years, we see that there are a lot of small um, organizations or groups coming up because they already found that they have to stand by themselves. There is no one to promote. And the other problem is uh, in Bangladesh, there is no funding at all. So once you are doing something, 
Yeah, it's all uh, you have to do on your own risk. And you have to invest from your own pocket. So that's the big trouble. So uh, uh, like apart from my artistic journey, when I think about uh, our trust that what uh, I am associated with, then um, it's very hard to find the money uh, from there. So every time you have to write a lot of projects, project proposals, then you get some money and then you can do all these things. Without money, you cannot do anything. I mean, you can do, you can continue, you can run, but if you have some ambitious projects in mind, you cannot do it. So you need some support. So um, some of our projects are uh, related to like artisans or craftsmen, or um, we do a project in the borderlands of India and Bangladesh. Because this, like, you know, getting the visa, even for here, it was so hard for me. <laughs> so uh, for Bangladeshis, it's really hard these days. Even uh, while, like, whole Europe is united now, we are separated. We are trying to be separated more and more. So uh, that kind of projects that the borderline projects that we have been doing um, over the years, uh, it uh, developed uh, with the uh, community around the border uh, because they are not Bang Bengali speaking uh, uh, Muslim community, uh, which we are like working with. They are all uh, from different uh, Tri tribes or uh, ethnic groups. And uh, we always talk about our pain about the separation like from Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, all this subcontinent uh, political problem. But we never think about those people who are also divided by the border. So after doing a lot of projects with them, we uh, did a project called No Man's Land, which we targeted, like it took four years to fulfill that project, like complete that project. Uh, we, in, uh, we were associated with our counterpart from India because we wanted artists from both parts, Bangladesh and India, to be together and without passport to go to the real no man's land, which was really, really hard, but we did it. So that happened in 2014. Um, that was uh, fantastic because, you know, uh, we did not think, both the authorities were really suspicious and the, our authorities, they said that, you know, you, uh, you can go but we cannot protect you because we are only 40 over here in the borderline, <laughs> while in Indian part they have like more than 200 arm, uh, um, armies or, you know, border guards. So, uh, finally we decided and we did it. But all, um, I am saying it that you do all these projects, of course, you know, whatever uh, you feel like um, has to be done. But at the same time, I also support that, you know, there should be more promoters coming up, more um, like collectors coming up, and there should be more galleries, commercial galleries coming up also. Otherwise, like um, I myself, I'm uh, lucky enough to, uh, work with uh, different galleries from abroad, you know, the three galleries in different parts of the world. But uh, not everyone is lucky like me, maybe. And um, also, you know, uh, all my works are going outside Bangladesh. My, uh, most of my works are collected by the um, collectors from abroad, not from Bangladesh. So, you know, that's another, uh, I think, another problem over there that we should look at. So just to stay on this one for one final question to kind of bring Pedro into this conversation a little bit and maybe you could say something about the residencies that you're hosting in, in your home because it strikes me that there's a kind of interesting conversation there about, about how those artists, for example, are coming and doing research into the history of Brazil. Sometimes they may have, maybe have a kind of diaspora kit, di diaspora, is that a word? diasporic kind of relationship to, to, to Brazil, but also they're kind of like coming in and maybe bringing a different kind of perspective on some of the kind of current situations there. First, I want to thank all my colleagues because now I'm feeling that Brazil is heaven, <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> uh, 
Well, regarding censorship, I don't think there is. Well, people can express themselves freely. At the moment, uh, yeah, but I has yeah. Uh, regarding you know museums, well, we are getting way better in the last five years. But uh, uh, regarding public money and private money, private money also can be very nasty. As we were talking, you buy the artworks and you put in the storage, and the artworks disappear. So, you know, I don't know what the solution is, but it's neither here nor there. Okay. Uh, regarding markets, we have you know tens of galleries. You know, in in São Paulo, you have galleries in Rio, in the Northeast, in the South. So there is a preactive uh, primary market. Besides, we also have a preactive secondary market, where people can sell the artworks that you know they don't want to have anymore. So you know, I I'm really impressed that uh, you know, even though I think that you know I come from. Uh, somewhere that is out of, uh, you know, reality, and then, well, suddenly I realized that things are working somehow. For instance, a museum just started an endowment project, you know. Uh, of course, it's small, but it, it, it's growing. So independent space, you know, you have a few in Sao Paulo that uh, can show the artworks that, uh, you know, galleries or museums are not showing, okay? So... Well, I'm very happy, you know, to figure this out. And uh, but regarding the projects we do there, we are engaged with a residency program that we have brought uh, over 30 artists, curators, and critics to São Paulo. Uh, we had this partnership, as you mentioned, with the Delfina Foundation. Uh, it's the sixth year now, uh, so one artist per year. We have, uh, we, we have, uh, and we don't have a partnership with uh, Maria Teresa Alves and Jimmy Durhan. We sent one artist, but you know, this only happens if uh, you know, we are in the same page. Uh, and now, you know, we just started this partnership at the University of Sao Paulo, where you know, um, we are funding um, like a scholarship for the for the artists to stay well in the in in a, with a group of scientists with artificial intelligence this uh, this artist has a phd in uh, in one of the chapters of his phd is artificial intelligence so we were able to put uh, to put this work uh, so i guess you know as a collection we are we are we are very active, and the idea is to do that. Unfortunately, uh, no one copies us, and uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, the idea was to uh, the game plan was, you know, we start to do that, and then wealthier people would, uh, you know, would follow up doing, you know, bigger things. But um, it's not happening at the moment. I guess one day, you know, things will change, and we are going to be, we are going to have more of these projects. So, do you have a sense of why people are not, other people are not doing it? I don't know. Because I, I think that uh, people that collect art, they, they buy art. Mm. You know. They leave most of the arts, uh, if you have a balance sheet, so they put in the, in the assets side, hmm. you know? And I don't know what is the, the real engagement, you know, uh, for artists. For instance, there is this incredible space that was, you know, on a, uh, that was a stronghold for the Jewish community that were against the militaries uh, in the 60s, you know? And I was the one that threw the first kosher dinner for the institution. And I'm not Jewish, and I don't eat kosher. <laughs> <laughs> but this turned out to be a pretty interesting thing because, you know, uh, at the end, you know, we, the guy that runs this, this, this space 
was able to say, well, listen, if uh, that guy that is not Jewish is throwing a kosher dinner to raise money for the institution, you know, I think you guys have to step up. And guess what? They stepped up, okay? So this, this kind of movements we want to do to see if people wake up. Uh, but slowly but surely, things are, are, are really changing, and I can realize that we are in the right track. And I guess this is the first time that I proudly talk well about Brazil, you know, in my entire life. <laughs> But I think, I mean, there's, 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 there's a few kind of lines of thought that I'd like to follow there, really. I mean, I guess the first is, is partly about um, some of the histories that we see in the fair today. And I mean, one of the things that I guess we touched on um, before, before we were kind of trying to figure out wh where this conversation would go was the idea that, in fact, what you see in the fair and what you see in the market is very often kind of reclaimed histories that at the time were very, very problematic. So whether that's kind of performance histories or some of the kind of things that we were talking about, about histories of Chinese practice in particular, that actually are sitting out there very kind of docilely this today. Um, and I wonder whether or not um, that there's something kind of that, that you recognize there in, in, in terms of that idea of what happens when you when you transform those kind of political practices into something that has to sit in the art market, whether they're the kind of contemporary practices or more historical. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I got the, the last okay. part of the question. Well, so I suppose this, um, I'm interested in in that that movement then from this idea of um, a, a political practice and how that happens in the place where you show it in Sicily or, or or the kind of politics that you're engaging with locally, and then what happens when you have to try and move that from somewhere to the into market. It. exactly? Yes. So, this of course it's. Really, an interesting question. I think is uh, can be the center of our discussion, no? Because we are in an art fair. So, um, uh, I want to make two anticipation in this uh, to, to say two things before. One that uh, for me it's also a job, no? Which is very simple to say, but it's true. It's it's I. I think it's important to say. So for me, the gallery, it's not my personal toy. So I don't come from a very rich family, you know, and then I run the gallery. No, I have an experience now of 12 years. So sometimes I've, I've seen also this. So I never felt guilty every time that I sold an artwork, I have to say, no. For me, to sell an artwork often is uh, to reach uh, the gasoline, uh, to reach uh, the fuel for me for my artists, for the project that we are supporting. Of course, uh, it's problematic uh, and, um, an ethical point of view, of course, no? I mean, it's problematic, not, uh, it's not problematic the fact that you sell artworks. It's more problematic um, as it all, uh, where the works will go from whom the money will come. Now, this is uh, something that maybe is more uh, complex. Mm, this is uh, a problem that we face every day, uh, talking, for example, to from whom the money, uh, from, from, um, from where the money come, okay? Since um, this, a work that is a bit particular, that is made by our artists, no? And um, uh, sometimes we, we, we have had, we, ha we have, uh, le let me say, a special agreement with the artists, no? More for geopolitical restriction. But then there is something that we are, some decision that we have to talk when we are alone. Sometimes in the art world, uh, things happen very fast. You meet people, it's interesting in something. So it can be very complicated because in, from one side you need the, the money. I can say one of the no, funny thing, one, uh, one thing that often when people want to touch me, want to hit me, make me this question. What would we do if, for example, Mr. Silvio Berlusconi will come in your stand and want to buy all the stand? Okay, this is a question, no? 
I think you know is Mrs. Berlusconi, but anyway, since we are given that we are in the other side of the planet, let me say who is him, no? He's, he has a big um, uh, corporation and a big uh, company, you know, that deal with a lot of things, but most of all with information, with TV, with the uh, newspaper. Let me also say that he has used all this to get some political power. Let me say also that he has been our prime minister. Let me say that he has been a disaster, no? And he has been a disaster because he has changed our way of life, our way of thinking, our system of value. But anyway, what would we do? Okay, in case of Silvio Berlusconi, we know who is him, no? And maybe we can say no. And there are other cases which are, I feel, a bit uh, problematic, okay? Because sometimes we try to put everything under a symbolic point of view. Because you can, at one point, uh, if you, sometimes you can uh, dig in properly. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you have to survive, you know? It's like when you do struggle and you, for example, you know when there is this uh, sort of boycotting campaign, no? So you can boycott Coca-Cola, you can boycott Nestlé, and then if you boycott Nestlé, you have to boycott thousands of products. Then you can boycott uh, clothes, and you start from Nike. But you can't boycott everything, because you will not survive, no? As uh, using an Italian metaphor, you, will, you have to live uh, inside the bell of glass, you know? So we decide, case by case. Uh, at some time, we have been able to, to say no. But to say no, we have to sell more artworks in other contexts, let's say. So this is my relation with the, the problem with ethics, which is very human sometimes, no? For me, it's not the problem of, uh, sometimes you have to deal with compromise. What is important is the, the level of ethics that you try to keep every day. I think we, we, we basically all have lines of ethics that we're not willing to cross, and like those are like different for each pe person depending on the case, right? And uh, really, like we live in a world where there is no outside. Like you can't really be outside the system. If you're outside the system, then you're not. You're just talking to yourself. You're just you know. So I really think it's about um, it's about being uh, like uh, it's about being liquid in a way, being able to change um, and morph in a way which allows you to continue your practice but survive at the same time. So it's, yeah, it's not really black and white ever, I would say. So I, I, I'm in agreement with you completely. About that. I, think, I think it's the danger of the presence, the danger of the now. Traditionally, uh, gallery space, uh, in, in order to advance, they have to think about the avant-garde topic, which the avant-garde topic, what is the f future, you know, what is the most updated future, whatever subject that is. Okay, so they curate shows, you know, you go there, okay, say, oh, I never thought of that. Oh, this is really cool. Okay, mission success. But in a close-up society, they no longer can function like that because a lot of uh, blind spot going on. You can't think this, you can't talk about that, you know, you can't talk about Hong Kong's independence, you know, you know and all kind of things. You cannot even call yourself Cantonese and you are not allowed to speak Cantonese, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of red lines everywhere. I mean, today is Winnie the Pooh, tomorrow it can be something else. <laughs> and, uh, it's not written down, that's the problem. So everybody's guessing. So in a situation like that, Artists would uh, just kind of uh, ref some artists would uh, uh, be very fast and just react uh, immediately uh, because it's part of their life and they are just answering to the spirit of the time. So they step in and just do the thing, not think about not thinking about economy or making money or showing that is not significant. But uh, so 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 that's a grace period to answer your what you're saying. That's a grace period. So some. So when, when the danger of the presence slowly becomes safer and safer, then uh, you have other artists uh, you know, coming out. And, 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 and the dealers and, and the gallery and the museum, if they're sensitive enough, then they say, oh, okay, I can see a phenomenon now. I can see a phenomenon now. And then, okay, let's curate a show. And, uh, you know. So I think it's important for artists as well as uh, cultural leaders to to not have to to not to to react fast and to uh, 
uh, don't be shy away from the spirit of the time and really uh, uh, preserve something for the future because what is wrong today could be right tomorrow. And what is right today could be totally rubbish tomorrow. Well, I don't know what cultural leaders are, you know, because I'm afraid of It's leaders. a government term. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid of leaders. You know, once you have the power, you know, you control something. So, uh, and then you manipulate, you know, what you show, what you say. You, you know, uh, I'm really scared, you know. So, I don't know. Uh, how far you know we can uh, we can be you know uh, of uh, of the system, but you know I think the artists should subvert the system. Like for instance, we have this artist in Brazil, Sildo Meirelles, that during the dictatorship he was stamping you know banknotes, you know sending messages. So suddenly you know you have messages you know all over with, uh, with a phrase, you know, that was absolutely against the system. So this was an incredible idea because it was just, you know, get the money, boom, boom, boom. And these notes were, uh, you know, flying around. So there are ideas to, to subvert the system. Uh, at the same point, you have to play with the system. You know, have to be smart, you know. Because you know you have to make money, you have to pay for your living. But uh, this is this this balance is very hard to find. Uh, but I think you know there are ways of uh, of managing this uh, this this situation. And you guys have to do that. You know, <laughs> all we can do is to find you know to say, well, listen. Uh, I guess that if you go in this direction, you know, you can make things happen, you know, because this, this, and that. Well, I actually talk a lot with, with, with Basil, you know, since we first met in Brazil. And I'm always thinking about, you know, uh, how, you know, this works, you know, uh, can achieve uh, all the the how to say the potency the the pot yeah that, that this work has you know and well we have to be smart and we are smart so we can outsmart you know museums we can outsmart art galleries you can outsmart everyone so it's just a matter of being focused and uh, and think in a precise way uh, and this is when uh, I think art will have an impact. I think it's also important that it's not like a, I think there's a little bit of a, there is the art world and there are many art worlds within the art world. And I think what's really um, significant is not to be stuck in that world, not to be stuck in this echo chamber where you're doing things in the art world for the art world for yourself and speaking just to the art world. It's really about essentially using the art world to survive, but to speak to the world, to speak to, to the public outside of that art world, I would say. So you, you, you exist in that art world, but you exist in the world. And I think the danger is to like forget about the world and only think about the art world. And then you're just, you know, you're just kind of self-perpetuating yourself and the art world and it just becomes, you know, it's okay to come to a fair and make a sale and then go practice your politics at home. <laughs> you know, that's fine, it's not, you know, yeah, people um, talk about art fair saying that, wow, this is the market, this is blah, blah, blah. Well, th this is a perfect, you know, place to try to do some uh, subversion, <laughs> you know, because here is where the money is, you know. So how we are going to play that, you know, I don't know. But, uh, you know, this is the place or like a big museums, big institutions. If you are able to penetrate, you know, uh, an institution and force the institution to show your work, you are achieving your, your objective. If the work goes to the storage, you know, probably you know the person that bought didn't understand or bought on, on purpose to store and to take this work out of circulation. 
we have uh, to understand. We have to play with them. No, mm, I want to reconnect myself with what he told us that if I have to sum up is that we have to take also our responsibility with the society. It's not only of the work. And you told uh, these things about the museum, no? Uh, that we have to find a way to penetrate the museum. I really hope that this uh, engagement come also from the museum directly. That we don't need to penetrate him every time because it can be complicated, I think. Huh? So, <laughs> let me say this. Um, some years ago, uh, I was visiting uh, the Van Abbe Museum in uh, Eindhoven. No, okay, it's a special place because it's the Netherlands, so it's like uh, can be another bubble for other things. Okay, so you can do a lot of things. There are money, and the artists are supported. Anyway, what really let me think uh, is that during this. Um, visit in the museum, at one point uh, they show me one room that they call uh, the emergency room. The emergency room. So it's a space, if something happened, if there is something of important, if we feel something locally or another part of the world, we can like in a few weeks, in one week, we can arrange a show. We can do something, we can invite people. So we take the responsibility of our day life, okay? So this, I think, fit with both the discussion. No? And this is also a metaphor, what we should do with our activities. We should be like an emergency. So all, of, all, all of us, we should have a sort of emergency space, you know, have emergency room in our life, no? This is, it's, and I hope that this comes from the museum. We are planning a, a, a virtual exhibition very soon, you know. Uh, so it's just a matter of uh, upload, you know, images in the, in the internet, you know, writing a very precise text, you know, and then you pass the message. So, and I guess this is a way actually to subvert, you know, the system in the sense that um, most of institutions will say uh, no, 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 you know, so you, you can use the web. And uh, this thing of, uh, that I always stress, which is the putting the works in, into storage, this is the real censorship without being a censorship, okay? okay. So they are censoring your production by putting these works in the storage. So, you know, I think that censorship is a thing of the past, you know. If you have money, you buy all your artworks, put in the storage forever, you are forgotten, you know. And like fake news, you know. So fake news is the new censorship. You, you throw fake news on top of fake news on top of fake news, it becomes reality. So this thing of censorship, I really think that it's, it's, it's gone. We have a smarter way to, to censor everyone. And we have to fight that. So then, I mean, I guess the so there's something really interesting there about this idea about how, in that sense, the, the problem is not necessarily about what the market might do to the meaning or to the agency of the practice, so much as what happens to it once it's been bought. So that this idea of things being taken out of circulation is and is therefore rendering them kind of invisible. Um, so that is it, it, a slightly different kind of problem to the problem that that is one about the way that those practice gets talked about in the context of the art market and whether or not that kind of dialogue around it is somehow kind of neutering its meaning. Um, is that a kind of problem that you think about at all or is that for you then not a problem? I think that... Um, I think that the, the problem is more that how, how the work can be used to whitewash certain things. So, you know, you could be manufacturing weapons, killing people, and then you could say, but I'm an art collector, <laughs> right? And so how, how, how you know, then your, your artwork, and you're not just an art collector, you're, you collect radically political art, right? 
So it's not you don't, you don't just collect paint like you know nice looking paintings for like you know that look nice in your house. No, you collect serious political you know in, politically engaged art and you sell weapons at the same time. For example, so 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 why you know and this is for this is for me like what makes me anxious. I would say more about like the art market and where it would go. Um, I don't necessarily have any illusions about. Um, I don't have any illusions about um, creating some form of political action through selling an artwork to a rich person, like to a, you know what I mean? Like it's not, you know, that's um, that sort of, that's a different kind of engagement and that, you know, that does other things. And we can be politically active through our works in many spaces. We don't need to just do it in the art world. like. That's that's you know so the market is more about for me like what makes me anxious is how that can be used. I think I think the economy always uh, uh, find its way in no matter how 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 much the artists want to uh, avoid it, such as the the uh, um, the public art movement in the sixties, right? Spiral jetties and all those uh, land art. You know, the artists originally don't want you know just. Kind of fed up with this kind of fair stuff and just sort of kind of went to the jungle, went to the uh, countryside to start making work and then and then the, the, the money just come in with the camera and just take a picture <laughs> and sell the picture, you know, with a uh, rock as a bonus. So, so, so it always going to be like that. So I think uh, uh, once the grace period is over, once the degenerated art is no longer degenerated, is the in thing to collect, and then maybe 50 years after. So, um, so I think it's it's not. Um, I I don't think we should think too much about it. I mean, but we should do the background check. I mean, I do. Yeah, who's who's buying my my? Uh, oh, somebody interested in buying my work? Or who are you? You know, yeah. wiki or background, and uh, it's important because. Uh, by selling your work to those kind of organizations or individuals, you're actually endorsing that uh, individual or organization. So, so um, uh, which is uh, it can be very problematic, you know. So, so I mean, pers it's a personal thing. Yeah. So, so sometimes I don't sell because it's the wrong group who are interested. And sometimes I would uh, like the work I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, I have no enemies. I actually saw a photograph of that and then used the funding uh, to donate to a person who got wrongly uh, 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 prosecuted by the Hong Kong government for his uh, lawyer fee. And I think uh, it's, it's an interesting way to think about uh, how the work can, can further produce into the social cause or political cause. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. Yeah, I agree with what what Basel was saying about the inseparability, right? I mean, the, of society. You know, artists. I think in the present and the future don't only exist in in the art art world between the four, the white wars, mm -hmm. where, whereas uh, you know whole whole kind of living and the, the rethinking about uh, one's time in the society. You know, and and becomes the artwork. Yes, and also let me say that um, I really think that, uh, I can say, the most important thing is to deal carefully with the people that we are working with or with the people that we are working about. So I always felt uh, at least less problematic the problem of the relation of the market. If you have uh, a strong uh, mm, relation, if you have, um, if everything is clear in the making of uh, work, this is my personal opinion. If everything is clear, because we are talking about art and activism, so since we are talking about working with communities and we're talking about people, sometimes talking about with people with this are suffering. So which is important is to be, so for me, eh, because I'm, I am a gallery, so I have less problem with the market maybe, but uh, I feel always more problematic this aspect that come before. So when, this is my personal opinion. I, I could make example because I, I live in Sicily, which for example is, um, 
is the place of the migrant, just for example, talking about this, and this has become a sort of, uh, at least in Europe, uh, the core business of a lot of artists, so with a lot of problematic things uh, that come out from this aspect. So I feel the most important things is to have, uh, that people understand your code, at least. And then maybe, again, taking gasoline, taking fuel, selling an artwork can be maybe a little bit less uh, problematic. I think I have a solution here for the censorship. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Uh, you're going to take me to Beijing. I'm going to tell the authorities, listen, you buy everything that is available, <laughs> everything. You take everything, you know, to uh, the most, the biggest museum of the world in the middle of the Gobi Desert. You put everything there, you know, and you put a gigantic wall also that no one is able to go there. So the work is on display in a museum, okay? They're all there. The artists can make a living, and we are all set, right? I think, I think they're already doing that in Xinjiang. They oh, have like they? about yeah, they have about 50 uh, concentration camps there, and and uh, almost like more than one million uh, Xinjiang people are imprisoned, uh, yeah, and doing some. I think I think the forced labor being there. is a BBC well, uh, with, with artworks or without artworks. Well, they are singing songs. Uh, they're forced oh. to learn how to sing the Chinese national anthem in two days. Poor kids. <coughs> I've seen videos of that. Not, I'm not sure if it's real or fake. But I'm I pretty think sure um, um, just listening all of you, I was thinking about my background also. Like, um, I don't mind selling my work; I love it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Right? Anyway, when I when I started uh, doing the objects that you have already said, maybe on the um, from this uh, presentation, I did not think that uh, people will uh, pay any attention. Or maybe you know there will be like, collectors will be interested to collect them, but uh, apparently um, you know and surprisingly it was very good for me. And yeah, I love to uh, of course I love to sell not for only surviving, uh, but for doing a lot of other things that I want to do. Since I told you that there is no funding, public funding in Bangladesh, so I can be my own investor. So that I can work with uh, whatever you know I like to do with like sometimes with the transgenders, uh, do a long-term project with them, or do something related to the borderlines. Or some, I know that no one is there to uh, give me anything. So that should be me who would sponsor myself. So that's how you know it works. So uh, it depends on the people also, like you know how they use their money into different things. So we've actually only got a very few minutes left. Somehow this time has gone very quickly. So I wondered if there are any uh, questions from the audience um, just for the last couple of minutes. Come on, guys. <laughs> Oh yeah, big time. Uh, we are afraid that we are, because we have a tax incentive law, okay? Uh, and we are afraid that uh, they, are, they are gonna cut that, all right? So this tax incentive law is used, you know, for in, independent art space, you know, for the big museums, for book publication, for theater, for performing arts, for everything. So it's, it's under threat at the moment, yes. Then I'm going to join all of them, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello, everyone. I came in the middle, so forgive me if you've already um, elucidated on something and which I missed. But uh, I mean, these are perennial concerns and questions, so I'm not saying anything new. But there are these two very polarized views. Uh, and I'm also, I'm, I'm an artist, and of course, 
I know that you all know that it's not unproblematic, the equation. But on the one hand, we, and I'm not saying you, but we feel that it's okay to come to an art fair and sell the works and then go and use that money in also ways which are probably outside of the um, very obvious capitalist concerns, etc. But at the same time, we also critique those who buy works, but also then espouse a politics which is completely radically opposite of ours, such as the selling of arms. So how do we either navigate that or, you know, how do we even discuss this? Well, you sell and then you complain. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, right? Yes. That's good. Actually, uh, your question uh, kind of related to what you wrote earlier about what are the risks of being both an activist and also an artist? Did you write this? Does good art make bad politics or good politics, bad art? So it's kind of like good, bad uh, kind of uh, uh, duality. I, uh, actually, I, I always like to replace uh, good and bad with strong and weak. So like strong work, uh, weak work rather than good work. You know. So so like how's the show, Padro? Strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. No, how's it was it good? No, no, it's not. It's, oh, it's kind of weak. Right? So so I think um um the way I, I look at the, the practicing fine arts and, and, and dealing with uh, the political subject matter is uh uh, and, and the economy and all these commercial activities. I used to hate, uh, I used to uh, only come to these kind of events to only look at the rich people's uh, girlfriends. You know, I, find, I find them very, very attractive, you know, just like floating like an like a, like a, like a angel. But this is actually uh, a street market with uh, air conditioning. Yeah, that's what it is. It got nothing to do with the local art scenes. Right, and uh, it's very uh, kind of like both feet off the ground, but at the same time, I think um, it will slowly pick up. It will, after years and years, it will slowly pick up. It, it, it will repolish itself and and uh, become more and more uh, interesting. So, in terms of uh, the 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 kind of contradictions of like, why am I here, <laughs> right, and what's it got to do with me? I think. Uh, is 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 a slow learning. It's going to a slow learning process because this thing is a very international, and it never have the time to get into the local uh, situation. But but as long as the work is strong, then someone bound to notice it later on. Maybe not now, but 50 years later, wait and see. But let me tell you one thing that is really concerns me. I, I see artists that are in the collection that are turning 80, 80 something, and you know they have uh, they are not having a decent end of life. All right, mainly if you are in the U.S. because you have a no uh, social system, so they you cannot have a care like a daycare or whatever, you know. So. Sell, sell when you can, not when you have to. Okay, we always say this in the financial market before the crisis come. You know? um, since I got in my past a lot of advice from the artist uh, that helped me a lot, uh, maybe I have just one advice for the artist. Okay, it, and yes, how to deal with this. Uh, big things, uh, it, it's something that I feel really strong. Try to keep your sides small. Try to keep your sides small, because if you keep your sides small, maybe you have opportun an opportunity to survive in one way, but also to be, um, to survive to the system, so that you don't become something else. This is- So what what's, big? what's big, is, is them and hers big? What'd you say? No, no, I'm just trying to, you, see, you try um, to keep yourself small I mean, I, or try to keep the work small? It's <laughs> just controversial. Just to clarify. Also, also, no, no, of course, okay. This is also controversial, no? But I think that if... Sometimes that's not in your hands also. 
<laughs> well, you, you become so big, you know. <laughs> well, Stanley Brown is big. This is the slide I have there. You know, it's a blank slide. Because uh, you cannot, uh, Stanley Brown never let, uh, you know, one of his artworks be being published, you know. So this, the work is very strong, even more when I can show the work in a blank slide. I think we might leave it there. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. Um, thank you. Thank you thank for you. being here. It's been really interesting. Thank you. <laughs>